Good evening and welcome. I'd like to acknowledge the local custodians of the land in which we meet this evening and honour Elders past, present and emerging. I'm Melissa Wilkinson from the Hunter New England Central Coast Primary Health Network, the education team. I'm just going to go through some um, housekeeping now. We're just going to ask you to remain on mute. We are being recorded tonight and the, this will be available in our education library through our website for a short period of time over the next coming week. Um, there will be a survey link in Suzanne's um, presentation this evening. So I'll ask you to have your devices ready because we're going to ask you to scan a QI for us um, to get some feedback. So if you have your device ready, that will be much more convenient for you. Um, also remember to use the chat box if you have any questions. There will be time for questions that will answer those and have a look at them. Um, RNCGP points for GPs are accessible for this evening. If you haven't already submitted your RACGP number, can you please email, email me on mwilkinson at hneccphn.com.au. So we have a resources sheet um, that has been kindly sent through that will also be available in the education library for you to access. And once before, as I've said before, the evaluation will be via SurveyMonkey. I've also put um, in the chat feature the link to that as well. And it will also appear in your emails, confirmation, follow-up emails as well. Now, it gives me great pleasure to hand over to our um, presenter for this evening, Suzanne Hull. And Suzanne is an independent respiratory educator with over 20 years experience in the field. Suzanne previously worked in the paediatric asthma educator at Gosford Hospital and was the education officer for the Australian Asthma and Respiratory Educators Association. Suzanne is currently contract contracted by the National Asthma Council and the Australian Lung Foundation, delivering asthma and respiratory education to primary health networks nationally. She's a co conjoint lecturer with Charles Stewart University in the asthma management subject. Suzanne's areas of interest are setting up nurse-run clinics. So without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Suzanne. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa, and thanks for having the NAC present this uh, webinar tonight. Welcome, everybody. Um, so tonight's title is Little Lungs, a Paediatric Asthma Update. So tonight we're really going to really be looking at the asthma, Australian Asthma Handbook because that's where our guidelines for management of asthma in Australia come from. And um, so I can't emphasise enough how important it is that everything we do should be based on those guidelines. We'll just do a recap of asthma, asthma pathophysiology, looking at the triggers, the diagnostic principles and the different categories of diagnosing the different age groups in kids as well, looking at the management principles, obviously talking about written asthma action plans, and then we're going to do through a bit of acute medical management in primary care as well. So because this has got RACGP points with it, um, there needs to be some learning objectives for those and you can see them there at the moment. The learning objectives really, you know, are, are formal things that we need to do for the RACGP points. But basically what I would hope is that you at least go away with something maybe new tonight or something that you think, oh, I could do that a little bit better in our practices from now on. And it might start you thinking about how you do recalls and how you actually assess kids with asthma as well. So this is the Australian Asthma Handbook. It has its own website, so it's www.asthmahandbook.org.au. Um, hopefully you've all uh, seen and been on the website before and had a look at the handbook and if you haven't I really uh, urge you to go and have a look at it. It has a really good search engine so you just need to go in there, type in what you're looking for, it will ask you whether you want adults or peds, it will then take you to that particular resource. And if you're trying to find the evidence of how they've come about with that guideline, it will has all that there for you. And then you can just click on that link and it will bring up where they've got all of that information from all the articles and everything as well. So it is really, um, you know, the, the, um, the thing for uh, putting uh, asthma management guidelines in uh, usable format for primary health care as well. 
So this is the National Asthma Council's website and the National Asthma Council is really the peak body for health professionals in asthma. So it has a whole bunch of resources there. And again, if you've not been uh, to that website, I urge you to go and have a look at it to see you know, the, the resources that you can download for there. Melissa mentioned that there's um, a resource list uh, with in the chat box as well, and this is where most of those resources have come from. Um, because the National Asthma Council is actually located in Victoria, they have copped it terribly over the previous 12 months with COVID, and so their office has basically been closed most of the time. So whereas we would normally have been able to ring up and say, mail me out, you know, 20 copies of, of this, uh, at the moment we can't. So um, they were back in the office one day a week, but now they're shut down again. So at the moment, it's really going on and downloading it yourself, sending someone an email, and hopefully eventually they'll get back to work and be able to send you out as many copies of things as you would like. So really, if we have a look at uh, children and asthma facts, Asthma is one of the most common childhood conditions. It accounts for the most uh, common cause of presentations into primary care. It accounts for the most presentations to emergency departments and around about 23% of all paediatric admissions to hospital are due to asthma as well. About 20 to 25% of those admissions occur in February, and it's usually around about that second and third week back at school. So. Uh, there's a whole bunch of reasons why it's thought that that time is much higher. Uh, you know, the kids have been on holidays over the summer months, they've been really well, so their preventer medication has been stopped over that time. They go back to school, they're now surrounded by uh, a whole bunch of other kids, can be new kids, and they go through that whole viral, um, you know, development again. So every time they pick up a cough or a cold, bang, their asthma flares up. There's also other reasons of not only stopping preventer, but increase, um, you know, exposure to new viruses. The classrooms have been locked up for six weeks, so they go back and they're dusty. The grass has just been mown before they go back to school. And quite often it can be cat allergen on some uh, person that they're sitting with that, that could be triggering their asthma as well. So it's really important in that last couple of um, weeks before they go back to school for us to talk to our parents and say, we need to start the children back on their preventer medication for at least two weeks before they go back to school to try and stop these uh, flare ups and needing them to come into hospital. We know that asthma is much more common in boys than it is girls up until around about the age of 14, 15, and then it's much more common in females after that age group. And then we know that there's uh, you know, certain hormonal factors that come into play with that as well as being the allergic component and the inflammatory mediators. I guess the important thing is that not all children with wheeze actually have asthma. So about two out of three of children with recurrent wheeze aged in the one to five year old group actually don't have asthma once they're beyond the age of six years. And I suppose that that's where it comes back to where a lot of people have said, you know, their kids have grown out of asthma. And the reality is it's probably just a different phenotype in that asthma um, that, you know, produces asthma-like symptoms, but they don't actually have the true underlying inflammation going on in their airways that then leads them to continue on post six years and into adulthood. I think um, the sad part about some of the stats here is that around about 21% of kids aged between one and 12 report that they have been disturbed in their sleep from asthma in the previous four weeks. And so that's a really large number of kids that's telling us if they're waking at night time, they really do not have very well controlled asthma at all. Um, and so again, we need to be thinking that getting our diagnosis correct, looking at preventative medication to hopefully uh, reduce some of these stats that we're looking at. So because um, these uh, webinars were 
uh, initially put together last year when everything went into shutdown, uh, they were put together in a series of, and uh, paediatric asthma happened to be the second one. And so the first one was all about asthma and what goes on. So this is just to remind you that asthma is a chronic lung disease which can be controlled uh, but not cured. So in uh, clinical practice, so what we're doing, it's defined by the presence of having both excessive variation in lung function and a variability in respiratory symptoms. So that's just to remind you that asthma is something that comes and goes, and in between times, that person should be perfectly well. So that means they should have normal lung, should be able to have normal lung function in between episodes, and they should not have any symptoms there. Then once their asthma starts to flare up, they will start and develop symptoms and they will also start to have a change in their lung function as well. And the, those symptoms uh, occur due to narrowing of the airways from the inflammation of the inside of the airways, constriction of the smooth muscles in the walls of the airways and also an increase in mucus production. So really, when we're talking with our patients, we should be talking to them about three things happen inside their airways. They get um, swelling and inflammation on the inside, they get muscle tightening, and they get an increase in mucus production. And this is just some of the um, you know, pictures that we can show them what it's like. And I guess you can see here that someone with a normal airway on the left-hand side there, nice smooth relaxed muscle, nice uh, no inflammation there and a nice big hole where the air travels in and out. The person who with asthma um, and probably the majority of people who have got asthma will have some little bit of inflammation there on the inside and then the person who's having an asthma episode, you can see that tightening of that air, um, smooth muscle on the outside and the increase in that mucus product, I mean increase in that uh, lining on the inside of the airways and what you can't see here very clearly is an increase in mucus production. Those three things going down and closing down the size of the air hole that the person's trying to breathe in and out of. It's a really good thing to be able to show someone because then you can say, this is why I'm giving you the treatment that I'm giving you. This medication deals with that um, smooth muscle constriction. This medication deals with reducing that swelling and inflammation on the inside of the airways and to protect your airways from the irritants coming in and setting the whole process of asthma off in the first place. So the triggers for asthma in kids basically are pretty much the same as they are for everybody, but probably the biggest trigger factor for kids is the old normal cough cold flu virus. So every time they get a cough or a cold, bang their asthma flares up. <coughs> Excuse me. Exposure to cigarette smoke, and we need to be thinking about other things as well these days. So e-cigarettes, vaping, Looking at our cultural differences, oh, excuse me a minute. <clears throat> our cultural dis uh, differences and looking at water pipes, shishas and things like that as well. So we need to be asking about all of those things. Um, other things that can set kids off a weather change. So going from a really, uh, you know, warm environment in the house or car outside into the cold can instantly trigger some kids' asthma off as well. And rapid changes in the weather also, where it's been really warm one day and cold the next. And then the other things such as allergens to animals, as I mentioned previously, cats can be a big irritant as well, but it can also be all other sorts of animals. Uh, pollens and moulds, outdoor pollutions, and exercise and also laughter um, can be one as well. Uh, so we just need to think about those things. We also need to be thinking about how they can minimise their exposure to those irritants. Um, so avoiding cigarette smoke, obviously, thinking about the cold air change, you know, breathing through a uh, scarf or a, pulling their jumper up over their mouth and nose when they walk out into the cold air. Uh, thinking about if it's allergens and pre-medicating before exercise and to making sure that they get the flu vaccine and things like that as well for respiratory uh, irritants. <clears throat> so now we're going to break the uh, diagnosis and looking at asthma in kids over three different age groups. So firstly in these kids 0 to 12 months. 
So wheezing infants aged less than 12 months should not be treated as asthma, okay? Uh, you know, as Melissa said in the introduction, I've been in respiratory for a long time and sometimes you feel like the hamster on the wheel. When I first came into it, we never diagnosed a child under the age of two years. And then basically we started diagnosing everything that coughed and wheezed more than two times, regardless of their age. And now we are back to, we should not be diagnosing and treating a child under the age of 12 months of having asthma. The wheezing in this age group is most commonly due to acute uh, viral bronchiolitis or to small and or floppy airways that these kids have got. And so it's now recommended that advice, advice should be sought from either a paediatric respiratory physician or a paediatrician before you administer any short acting beta agonists or systemic um, corticosteroids or inhaled corticosteroids to an infant under the age of 12 months. So then we're going to have a look at the one to five year old age group. This is a really large group of kids and they can be quite tricky to actually get a good confirmation because they're still a bit too young to do objective measurements with spirometry. Um, and, you know, may or may not have some of the symptoms. Um, so we really need to be making sure that our diagnosis is correct. So the first thing we would start and do is do a history and do a really thorough history like you would with everyone else. We would look at a family history of asthma and remember that asthma tends to run in families but it's direct line so it's usually parents down to kids rather than second, third and fourth cousin removed. Has this child had a personal history of either eczema or allergic rhinitis in the past before? Uh, has there been maternal smoking, especially during pregnancy? Uh, has there been previous episodes of wheeze as well? Uh, have they got noisy breathing? The frequency and the timing of those previous uh, episodes, so is it over winter every time they get a cough or a cold? Has it been that second and third week back um, after school as well? And Things that you can do to find out if it's definitely uh, wheezing or noisy breathing that the parents are listening to is to maybe ask the parents to record the kids when they're actually having these episodes because quite often by the time they come to you or if it just happens to be something that they've mentioned to you while they're there for something else, that they've noticed their child wheezing, you do a physical examination and there may not be any wheeze there at that particular time. So get them to record it. Most parents have got smartphones these days that, where they can do a recording on. So the second thing that we would look at is obviously that physical examination. So have a look at what they look like. Um, so, you know, do a general physical examination. Observe those signs for rhinitis. Um, and so one of the things that kids do is they tend to do this bit a lot. And so that's called, um, you know, the allergic salute. They're these kids who are doing that. They tend to get, kids tend to get quite dark bags underneath their eyes as well. And they will then also develop a little crease across the top of their nose from constantly doing this bit. Look to see if they can breathe through their nose because we know that a lot of people with asthma, um, and especially if they've got allergic rhinitis, can't breathe through their nose. And so then they breathe in through their mouth, breathe in dust, dry, cold air, three things that will set asthma off as well. So see if they're breathing in through their nose. Uh, ask the parents, um, do they know if they breathe through their nose or not? And if the parents say, oh, I don't know, Ask them, do they, are they noisy eaters? Are they always getting into trouble for eating with their mouth open? You know, do the parents always have to say, chew with your mouth closed? And if they do, it's probably kids who can't breathe through their nose and eat at the same time. So they eat like that because they're trying to breathe and eat at the same time. Then obviously do a chest auscultation. If they've got a wheeze there, then you're going to hear it and it's probably quite suggestive, but not necessarily diagnostic that it is asthma. And looking at the shape of their chest. And I um, worry about this one a bit because in this day and age with all of the medications that we've got, we should not be seeing pigeon or barrel chests in any kids anymore, even adults for that um you know, in that instance anyway. So if we are seeing, you know, pigeon or barrel chest, it means that kid's hyperinflated and 
probably for them to have taken on that shape for quite a long time. So we really shouldn't be seeing that. But what you can look for is obviously uh, tracheal tug, have they got intercostal recession? Um, are they using their tummy muscles to breathe? Are they sinking in underneath their ribs as well? And again, that's only going to happen if they're in the middle of an acute episode when you're seeing them. And then, of course, we would do a treatment trial. So we would want to see, are they responding to a bronchodilator or a preventer when you give it to them um, as well? So therefore, the management in these kids, we would manage the, the majority of these kids, we would manage their symptoms as a, using an as-needed reliever. Uh, when they have their wheezy episodes there. Um, so a small proportion of these kids may need to have a preventative medication if they've got uh, recurrent cough, wheeze or breathlessness that occurs at least every four to six weeks and it needs to disrupt their sleep and or play as well before we would say they need to be on a preventative medication. We would start this group on a low dose inhaled corticosteroid or Montelukast. So Montelukast before used to be the drug of choice to start this age group on, but because of all of those reports that came out a few years ago about Montelukast and the um, you know, potential for uh, having you know, suicidal thoughts uh, in young kids, um, most parents don't want to put their kids onto Montelukast anymore, so now it's inhaled corticosteroids and add Montelukast if you want to um, steroid spare. This group rarely require a combination therapy of an inhaled corticosteroid and a long-acting beta agonist. Um, even though the guidelines uh, say we can, uh, or, or they, um, some of the medications have a PBS listing for five years, rarely should they be on, on a combo at this age group. And if they are, it would be done under the care of a paediatrician or a spiritual paediatrician. And obviously with every person, we need to be providing these parents and their carers with a written asthma action plan that clearly steps out what you want them to do when you want to do it. This age group is much better treated with a spacer, um, so a metered dose inhaler and a spacer and with or without a mask depending on their age. Usually from around about three and a half upwards, they could just use a mouthpiece alone, um, but if they're under that age group, attaching a mask um, to it is, is uh, preferable. So then if we go into the six years and over, this age group becomes a little bit easier because we can start and do um, some more testing, so spirometry. So we can get our diagnosis with a little bit more certainty. It's still based on history, so all of that history that we just looked at in that one to five year old age group as well, so family history, previous episodes, all of those things, that same physical examination, but in this age group, we can start and do spirometry. And then again, you can uh, do a treatment trial as well. So the uh, chart that you can see here on the side, these are taken straight out of the NAC uh, handbook. And again, it really just steps you through the process. Is a child able to do spirometry? Uh, no, then you would give them a treatment trial. If yes, then you would do spirometry uh, before and after bronchodilator and see what their reversibility is. If it's greater than 12% from baseline, you can probably quite easily say that yes, you could give them a, a definite diagnosis of asthma. Okay, and so these charts are really helpful to step you through everything as well. So really the diagnosis in children, we need to be uh, clear about our diagnosis because we do have a lot of kids out there who were taking inhaled corticosteroids for a long period of time who probably really don't have uh, asthma and don't need to be on them long term. So we can make a provisional diagnosis if the child has wheezing accompanied by breathlessness or cough and other features that in increase that probability of asthma such as history of allergic rhinitis, atopic dermatitis, or a strong family history of asthma and allergies. We want to make sure that there's no other signs that suggest an alternative diagnosis. 
and that they've had a good response to a bronchodilator um, or it's been demonstrated on spirometry for these kids. So if we look at management in kids over the age of six years, all school aged children with asthma need to have a reliever medication to be able to use when they've got their asthma symptoms there. And we need to make sure our kids know how to use them. So whether it be still through a and preferably through a puffer and a spacer, they should be able to know how to give it to them themselves. Uh, regular preventive treatment is indicated, as I said before, for those people who get their symptoms every four to six weeks or it, and it disrupts their sleep or play. And the dose is determined on the risk of uh, future episodes and the severity of those flare-ups that they've actually had. And then we would need to review them regularly to assess their control. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, we want to do steroid sparing in these kids. So we don't want to have kids on big doses of inhaled corticosteroid. So to do that, we would add on something like Montelukast. And in this age group, it would be okay to add on a, add in a combination therapy or commence them on combination therapy of inhaled corticosteroid and a long-acting beta agonist. And then the guidelines over the last 18 months have changed to that uh, for a child over the age of six with moderate to severe asthma, we can commence them on to teotropium in the Respimat uh, device as well. They need to have had an acute flare up or hospital admission in the previous 12 months and had previously diagnosed asthma for over 12 months for them to be able to do that um, as well. So this, again, is taken straight out of the uh, handbook, the NAC handbook, and like adults, it's using that stepped approach for kids age six to, this says um, 11 years, but potentially right up until 14 years, because the adult guidelines actually don't come in until they're about 14. So you can see step one down the, um, or before step one down the bottom. We need to be advising and prescribing reliever medication for them to carry around at all time, assess their individual risk factors and any comorbidities. So a risk factor would be, have they had a previous episode in the, in, um, have they had an episode in the previous 12 months? Do they live with so smokers? Have they had uh, an admission to hospital in the previous 12 months? Have they had an ICU admission? That would be a risk factor. Checking that they've got a, an action plan and making sure that both parents and kids know how to use that device. And so then the, most children will need as needed short acting beta agonists. So that's in the first step in the light blue. And then we step up if they're having those breakthrough symptoms to regular preventative medication and reliever as needed. And then stepping it up into the gray uh, section where they've got more moderate to severe. So they're starting to go on to higher dose uh, for pediatric um, dose that is of inhaled corticosteroids. You've introduced a combination therapy and um, Monty Lucast, and then if they're still not responding, we should be referring up to a specialist for specialised treatment. And then coming down through that, so once you've got control over that person, they haven't needed to use any Ventolin uh, for the previous, you know, six to eight weeks, we can think about starting to step that medication back down again. So if we look at what is asthma control in kids, this is different to the one that you may have seen for adults. And again, this comes straight out of the NAC handbook. So obviously good control means they've got no asthma symptoms there, everything's fine. So they don't have any daytime symptoms uh, per week um, at all, or if they've had it, it's less than twice per, uh, per week. It's only lasted a few minutes and it has been rapidly relieved by a short acting beta agonist. They've got no limitation on activities, so they should be able to run around, play games, play soccer, play netball, do whatever with no limitation on their activities. They shouldn't have any symptoms at night or during the day or first thing in the morning when they wake up. And their need to use short acting beta agonist should be less than two times per week. The only time that that would be different 
is if we're talking about, you know, 10, 11, 12 year old kids who are starting to get more into sport and maybe, you know, for instance, training a couple of times a week at their um, selected sport, they may be taking some Ventolin pre-sport and we wouldn't include that in their uh, using it more than two times per week. We would then say partial control is where they've got daytime symptoms more than two days per week, still only lasting a couple of minutes um, and rapidly relieved by a short-acting bronchodilator. They may be starting to get some limitation on activities. We, and also you need to remember that kids rarely give in. So they'll run, 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 run. They might stop for a minute, grab their breath, then they'll often run again. So quite often it's actually uh, doesn't interfere, start to interfere with their uh, activities until their asthma is actually quite progressed. Um, any symptoms during the night, so even if it's just parents hearing them cough or wheeze or first thing in the morning again, and needing to relieve, use that reliever more than two times a week. Um, and then poor control is either of these symptoms. So they either have daytime symptoms, needing to use a reliever more than three times a week then we would say that that child has poor control of their asthma. So the biggest reasons for poor asthma control are medication related issues, such as incorrect device technique. Um, it's, it's recorded that about 92 to 96% of people do not know how to use their uh, inhalers properly. And around about 56% of healthcare providers, so all of us here on this webinar tonight, haven't had any formal training in how to teach people how to use them either. Because um, I can't see anybody out there, those of you who are younger, so the younger doctors, younger nurses, younger uh, pharmacists, they are now starting to get training during their training, uh, instruction on how to do this during their training. But anybody who's older like me, we were taught purely by the pharma reps coming around and showing us which is, you know, the best device to use. And as you know, that can always be a little bit biased as well. So incorrect device um, is one of the biggest things. Poor adherence to preventer is probably the next thing. Parents don't like having their kids on um, medication. So as soon as the child starts to become better, the parents will usually stop that preventive medication uh, as well. Uh, issues can be around allergies. So they've got allergic uh, rhinitis, hay fever season can also uh, be an issue as well. So think about improving that nose, giving them something so that they can now start and breathe through their nose. If you improve their nose, you are going to dramatically improve their asthma as well. And then thinking about uh, are they still being exposed to uncontrolled triggers such as cigarette smoke, um, you know, is this, uh, you know, older child, when I say older child, from about 10 onwards, we know that they're starting to vape. Um, so thinking about are they now vaping, which is why their asthma is out of control. Are they exposed to any other things as well? Uh, is there limited knowledge of asthma and their management principles? So the parents might have an action plan, but if they are not game enough to use it, then they're, you know, won't be increasing the steps as it goes on as well. And making sure our diagnosis is correct, that it may not be asthma at all that we're dealing with. So just really quickly, I don't expect that you can see all of these and to be looking uh, at these alternative diagnoses. But basically, if we just say look down on the blue side and we go to unilateral wheeze, this could be suggestive an inhaled foreign body. Um, so, you know, have they inhaled a pea? Have they inhaled a piece of, uh, a tiny piece of Lego? Have they inhaled the back of an earring or something like that, which we have had uh, people do? Um, so especially if they don't have their caps on, on their puffers, Older kids and adults can inhale things where they've been sitting down inside them. So looking at those uh, alternative diagnoses and making sure that we do have a correct diagnosis, uh, first of all. And so then we would say that we need to review these kids on a regular basis. As a rule, we would say, hopefully, if the child's got well-controlled asthma, we should be doing around about every three to six, six months. And we would do it more often if there are other things that 
um, concern us. So, you know, if the you know that these people are, uh, you know, poor users of their preventative medication, you might want to see them on a bit more regular basis because when they're seeing you often, that keeps them on track to use that preventive medication. You would do them more often if they're, uh, you know, still living in a house with smokers, uh, if they've had a previous serious exacerbation, if they've had an ICU admission, if they have uh, known allergens to uh, food, um, then we would probably see them on a more regular basis as well. Seeing them again that two weeks prior to the beginning of the school year, which I mentioned earlier uh, as well. So getting them back, doing a new action plan for the beginning of the year, getting them on, back onto preventive medication so that when they go back to school, all is good. We would want to see them four to six weeks after you've made any changes to their medication. So whether that be a step up or a step down. So you've got them really well controlled, which is what we're hoping for. You've started to reduce the amount of inhaled corticosteroid they're on. You would want to review them about four to six weeks after to make sure everything is still going okay. We definitely say that they should be reviewed two to three days after a hospital presentation and then four weeks again after that. And there's some really good validated questionnaires that you can use when you're asking uh, for the symptoms. So the, the track, um, so test for respiratory and asthma control in kids is for kids less than five years of age. And it just goes through a series of questions. You can download those. If you just do a Google search for that, it will come up. Um, and also the Childhood Asthma Control Test, and so the C Act, is for four to 11 year olds. And again, it's just asking those questions. You know, how many times has the child woke overnight time in the previous four weeks? How many times have they needed to use their reliever medication in the previous four weeks? Um, you know, all of those types of questions and, uh, you know, how often have they used their preventative medication? Because again, it's also about how we ask those questions. So instead of when we're doing a review, just saying, you know, asking the question of how's your asthma, most people will say good. We need to be starting to ask them the questions are, you know, have you needed to use your reliever medication in the previous four weeks? Has your asthma woken you at night at all? Uh, are you taking your um, preventative medication? And if they look at you, you can say, it's okay. I know sometimes it's really hard to use your preventer, you know, twice a day, every day, even when you're perfectly well. So on average, how many times a week do you think that you would use it? And the main reason for asking uh, those questions is that some of these newer medications that are out there are once daily medications. So if the parent says to you, God, our house is just mayhem in the morning, trying to remember, uh, you know, trying to get the kids and myself out of the door to go to school and work, um, trying to remember to, you know, pack lunches, do that and fit medication in. So we, you know, most days miss the morning one, but we still remember to do the nighttime one. You could think about putting them on one of the newer medications that's only needed to be taken once a day, and that will overcome that problem as well. So it's about, you know, make, thinking a little bit more about how we actually phrase questions um, to our parents as well. And so at each review, as I said, we should be assessing those symptoms. We should be assessing each person and not just children, but everybody for their risk of future adverse events. Um, so not only from medication, but from future adverse events. So have they had a previous life-threatening episode of acute asthma or a hospital admission? That means they're at risk of having a future adverse event. That means they're at risk of having another episode within the next couple of months or certainly within the next 12 months. Have they had a history of sudden, severe, unpredictable asthma flare-ups? And so, you know, have they lived in uh, southern parts of New South Wales or even Victoria before where they've had, um, <coughs> pardon me, thunderstorm asthma and that has flared their asthma up as well? Perform spirometry on kids over the age of six, check their adherence, check their inhaler technique, Ask about smoking history, if, if the parents are still smoking, what they're actually smoking. Ask those older kids, have they started to smoke? Um, 
a check that they've got a written asthma action plan that's up to date and you're happy with it. Make sure there's been no modifiable environmental factors. Uh, look at those comorbidities such as the seasonal allergic rhinitis and ask the parents have they got any concerns. The biggest issue parents have got is the cost cost of the medication. If they're not on a healthcare card, it can be really expensive for these medications. Are they worried about these potential side effects from medication? Is that why they're stopping their inhaled corticosteroid? Because they're not, you know, really comfortable with giving their kids the steroids because they think they could be anabolic steroids. So making sure we've, you know, discussed all of of these issues and asking them what their concerns are every time we see them as well. So we might just stop there quickly and see if there's been any questions. Yeah, so if anyone has any questions, can you pop them in the questions or the chat box for us? Um, and Suzanne will answer those for you. I'll just give you a couple of minutes to have a think and pop those in. Okay, all good. I've had another drink, so <laughs> we're good. Yep. So we'll just keep moving on then. Yep. Oh, why won't we go now? Okay, so this chart is just um, to show you the new uh, asthma and COPD medication chart that came out um, last year in about September. It was was to uh, include some of the newer medications out there, but uh, like all of these charts, as soon as you update them, there's a new medication that comes out and so they can be out of date pretty quickly. You've all seen this medication, or you can contact them and ask them to mail it out to you as well. They come in A4s and A3s as well. Um, what's good about these charts is it puts the medications into their groups for a start. And I don't have to tell you, but our patients don't know the names of the medications that they're on. And because we live here on the coast, you know that our population is quite transient. So during holiday seasons, we get lots of people come, and weekends, we get lots of people come visit us on the coast. And so they may end up in your GP practice uh, and they don't know the names of their medication. They've come away on holidays and they don't have it. If you've got one of these charts, they can just point to the, the medication they're taking and you can actually see what they're doing. The other thing about the chart is it quite um, clearly points out if a patient is taking two medications within the one class uh, of, of medication as well. And the other thing that it's now got on it is it's got the QR scan me code um, down there and that will then take you to the NAC website which can uh, show you how to use each different device as well. So if you've got someone there and you know you don't have any placebos to be able to demonstrate correct technique of how to take the puffer just going on to the NAC website by using this scan me will take you there and you can watch a video together um, of how they should actually be using that medication. So this is really just to say what is meant by a high and a low dose of inhaled corticosteroids in kids. I guess it's to, just to reiterate that two puffs of one does not equal two puffs of another. So we really do need to make ourselves familiar with uh, each one of these medications and what's a low dose and what's a high dose of, of that. So if you have a look there, you can see that QVAR, a low dose is one to 200 micrograms per day and over 200 is classified as a high dose. Whereas Ormacort and Symbicort, two to 400 dose micrograms per day is classified as a low dose and over 400 is classified as a high. And the other thing that we also need to think about is having a look at these different um, medications and their uh, now used by uh, dates. So the things like elliptor devices that come in the pre-packaged little tins 
they have a variation between 30 and 56 days once they open that foil packaging of those devices. So again, it's something that we need to uh, familiarise ourselves with what all of those uh, use-by dates are for some of these newer medications once they're taken out of the foil packaging. Because now they have nothing added, no additives in them, finite powder that's in there, they are incredibly photosensitive. So they do have much shorter shelf lives, uh, or not shelf lives, uh, used by dates once they're actually opened as well. So again, this chart is on the NACs, in the asthma handbook. Um, and so if you're going to be prescribing somebody and you're concerned whether they're on a low or a high dose, you can go to this chart and check it out. So then looking at what devices would we use for children, as I mentioned earlier, the preference would be for a metered dose inhaler and a, a small or large volume spacer for a child with or without a mask. Um, so definitely a mask in under two year olds and yes, maybe for the two to, to five year olds. Um, once they're certainly over five, uh, puffer and spacer without a mask they can use. The dry powder devices, it varies. Some kids between five and seven can use them, but usually most kids over the age of eight can use them. And again, so it's really about testing the kids uh, if they are going to be able to use that elliptor device um, that you've prescribed this six-year-old kid, making sure they can use that and get the medication out of there. One of the easiest ways to check if they're getting the dry powder out of these dry powder devices is to put a little bit of blue cloth over the mouthpiece and get the child to inhale out of it. Then you pull the cloth off and you can see if there's any white powder that's on that cloth, that means they've had enough inspiration to be able to breathe that out. Otherwise we're going blindly and never really knowing whether they're getting a full dose or whether they're not. And because we're not talk really talking about devices, the other thing is that with dry powder devices, um, they need to be a fast, deep breath. Okay, so the metered dose inhalers and the things like the recipe mats and the spaces, the kids can just breathe that in slowly at their own pace. Once they go to a dry powder device, it has to be fast because it's only their inspiration that is um, you know, getting that medication to come up off the dosing plate. So they can't do a nice slow little big suck in, it needs to be fast. So if we look at written asthma action plans, like I've said all the way through, every kid needs to have a written asthma action plan. We know that it reduces the amount of school that kids miss and therefore it reduces the amount of work that their parents miss. We know that it improves the health outcomes of them so they don't have any symptoms of a night time. It helps them recognise worsening asthma, lets them know when they should be increasing medication, gives them advice on when they should come and see the doctor and certainly tells them when they should be calling an ambulance. The one that we've got there is obviously our NAC's own one, but it doesn't really matter which action plan that you give them. If you're using medical director or best practice and you do it, drops down into that, that's perfectly okay as well. Just remember that the um, uh, action plans are worked out on the traffic light analogy, green meaning go, no asthma symptoms, orange meaning hey, slow down asthma symptoms, coming on and red meaning stop full on asthma episode there. So whatever you're doing should have a combination of symptoms and the treatment that you want them to have. So if we look at early warning signs of asthma in kids, um, so parents know their kids better than anybody else. And they've quite often, you know, know these signs that they're seeing in their kids a couple of days or so before they're in full on asthma symptoms or that coughing and shortness of breath has actually started. And one of the first things is these dark circles that these kids get underneath their eyes. Um, adults get them for a different reason. We get them because we're tired or whatever, but they're called the allergic shiners and kids get those really early. It may even be a little bit of red as well. They go quite pale in the face. 
and they might have the runny nose, snuffy, sneezing. Uh, if they get eczema, their eczema usually flares up a day or so before the asthma episode comes on. They can feel tired, they're irritable, have trouble sleeping, they may uh, get headaches. You may then notice them starting to get that coughing or breathlessness on exertion. Or when dad comes home from work in the afternoon and wrestles and tickles and makes them laugh, they get, you know, laugh, 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 cough, 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 laugh, 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 cough, cough, cough. Um, and that can be an indicator as well, whereas normally, you know, you can come home and play with them and it doesn't uh, have a problem. And then obviously coughing and wheezing. They should be referring to their action plan. And then obviously the symptoms of an acute asthma, obviously shortness of breath, so it may present as that rapid shallow breathing, looking at tracheal tug, okay? The parents need to look at what the kids look like in the beginning. Uh, some little kids who have got quite chubby little necks, you may not notice anything there. Some other people have not a nice big hole there anyway. And other people like me, it's nice and flat. But what doesn't happen is it doesn't dip in and out with every breath that that person takes in. So when they're starting to get short of breath, you'll notice that tracheal tug happening quite early. They may have a wheeze. Um, obviously, the, you know, the worse, the louder the wheeze, the worse their, their symptoms are. Coughing, particularly at night, usually between the hours of midnight and 4am. The use of those accessory muscles, pallor and lethargy and irritability. So management, we need to do the assessment on the hop. You need to be looking at them and starting some treatment straight away. You need to really quickly assess whether you think this is a mild or moderate or a severe or life-threatening episode. Whack, whack a pulse oximetry on, start bronchodilators straight away, and then do your secondary assessment to see if they're starting to, if that you know bronchodilator is starting to work. Then look at your management and arrange for follow-up after that. So if we're going to have a look at a primary assessment, the kids walk in. If they've got a mild and moderate episode, they can walk in the door, no problems. They can still talk in full sentences like I can without needing to take a breath and their oxygen saturation should be above 94 to 95. If they're having a severe episode, you're going to notice that accessory muscle use, the tracheal tug, they can't speak in full sentences um, and they're obvious in respiratory distress and their oxygen sats are somewhere between 90 and 94. We do not want kids to drop under 90. If they do, they are basically having a life-threatening episode of, of asthma. Uh, any signs of you know, reduced consciousness, that exhaustion, we do not want to see any cyanosis and that silent chest is something that we should be pass, you know, pressing that emergency button about. Kids lose oxygen much quicker than adults, but they should, um, they get it back also much quicker than adults as well. So we do not want kids to go less than 90%. So the management of a mild to moderate, obviously we would be giving Ventolin or Salbutamol via a spacer. Um, so in the one to five year old group, we would start between two and six puffs. And in the six year old and older, we would go between four and 12 puffs. Remembering that when you use a puffer and spacer, it's shake it, one puff in, the child takes four breaths out, shake the puffer again, one puff in, four breaths out. And you do that whether they're going to have four or 12 puffs, okay? And then you would repeat that 20 minutely. So like in the old days where we used to do 20 minutely nebs, we're gonna do that now with puffer and spacer. As I said, pop oxygen on them and maintain their oxygen sats above 95%. And you need to watch these kids for at least three hours. If there's no response, obviously you're gonna call an ambulance and get them out of there and continue to give them salbutamol via that spacer until the ambulance arrives. The only time we need to use nebulized uh, Ventolin at this stage is if the child's unable to breathe through that spacer, then we would go on to nebulizers and then consider giving that person some oral corticosteroids within the first hour. And the oral corticosteroids, as a reminder, is uh, one to two milligrams per kilo for the first dose, and then one milligram per kilo for the next two doses, for the next two days, up to a max of 50 milligrams only. 
And so then obviously emergency management of life threatening, we need to go to straight oxygen driven salbutamol. So not just your nebulizing pumps that you may have in your practices, they are purely just air compressing pumps. You need to give it via oxygen um, and you need to drive it at eight litres per minute and you need to fill those nebulizing bowls up to, four mil, to a four mil volume. So that can be either two 2.5 milligram nebules for the one to five year old age group or one 2.5 milligram and two mils of saline to make it up to the four mil volume. And then kids over the age of six, two five milligram nebules can go in there or if you're you know, erring on the side of caution, one five milligram nebule and add two mils of saline. Drive it at eight litres per minute and do that continuously until you get a response. Again, maintaining their oxygen sats at above 95% and arrange for an ambulance to transfer them. If their dyspnea improves, um, you can change them back over to puffer and spacer or you can reduce it back to just doing those 20 minute lean nebs. You can also think about adding at this stage um, some atrovent, nebulised atrovent as well. And I'm not sure how many people uh, would have the IV magnesium to, to do at this stage, um, but that's one of the things that it's certainly given when they come into emergency departments uh, in an acute episode as well. I know these charts are hard to see here, but again, they are downloadable from the NAC's website and it really just steps through everything again there. These posters um, can be uh, up into A3 sizes as well. So again, it's good to have in your, in your treatment room so you can go through each step and assess their severity and say, okay, at this stage, this is what I need to be doing. I need to get some um, oral steroids into them. I need to nebulise them now at this stage um, and I need to be doing that at eight litres per minute and I need to, uh, you know, be giving it continuously. So it's a good thing if if you're going to be, uh, you know, seeing kids bounce into your surgery where you may need to be using these acute guidelines. And so obviously after they've had an acute flare-up, uh, we would want to see them two to three days after that. And then again, two weeks after to do a comprehensive review to try and find out why that uh, flare-up happened, what was leading into that, uh, you know, did they not know their, their trigger factors, uh, did they not, weren't they not comfortable enough to start up on their action plan, did they not give enough Ventolin, were they just giving, you know, two puffs every four hours instead of knowing that they could actually give six puffs of Ventolin to their child who's under six years of age and 12 puffs of Ventolin to their child who's over six years of age. Because traditionally it's always just been two puffs of Ventolin and so people worry about it when you say, you know, give your kid six puffs every three to four hours, that's fine. Um, then we would wanna review, you know, were they still using their preventive medication? Had they run out, you know, because they didn't have enough money to buy another script, you know, to fill another script? Uh, did they, you know, didn't have enough money to buy a spacer? Things like that. Um, you know, did they not have a reliever available? Was it out of date? Was it empty? Again, checking their technique, providing their, them another action plan, and that may just be an action plan now because you wanted to increase the preventative medication that they were on for the next you know, couple of months to get them over this. Because remember, any child who's had this severe um, flare up like that is at risk of having another episode within the next couple of months. So you may wanna increase preventative medication for that time. Do spirometry if they're old enough to do it and review and modify by that treatment plan. This is just the community first aid protocol, which is taught to all of our schools, all of our sporting facilities um, and community centres. So this is just what people out in the community do. So they come across, you know, a teacher at a school comes across a child having a, an ep asthma episode. They sit the child down, they get the um, first aid kit from wherever, or hopefully the child's got their own puffer on them. They give four separate puffs of short acting beta agonist via a spacer. Uh, remember, shake, one puff, four breaths, 
shake, one puff, four breaths, shake, one puff, four breaths, shake, one puff, four breaths. They then wait four minutes. And if there's no symptoms, they repeat that four single puffs and four breaths for a second time. So then they've given basically eight puffs of Ventolin and they've waited eight minutes. And if there's no improvement in that child, they call an ambulance to get them out of there. And they continue to give four puffs every four minutes until help arrives. And it's important if you're gonna go out and do any school education or sporting education to reassure those people they're never going to give too much. The biggest issue that can be is that they don't give the child enough medication. Uh, so as I say, that's what we teach in schools. And then just some information now of asthma and, uh, during COVID. Uh, it's changing all the time and things have gotten a little bit had gotten a little bit better but again there could be some uh, setbacks now uh, after the recent outbreak in Victoria so we need to make sure that everybody who has asthma a current action plan and the reality is that most people's asthma has actually been better during COVID as well so potentially they're not being surrounded by as many um, you know viruses because of we're well isolated and we've been thinking about it. Only um, perform spirometry if it's absolutely necessary and thinking about uh, you know, infection control, the recommendations are on the NAC's website for the latest guidelines, but basically we can now go back to doing spirometry in GP practices if the person is afebrile um, and isn't having escalating symptoms, you know, respiratory symptoms at all, and you do have good infection control techniques. That means that you have to have a filter on the end of the device where the air is actually being blown out into the room. And it also means that you have limited people in the room, so it should only be the, the person having the spirometry done and the tester, and that you need to make sure that you can wipe down all of your um, gear and everything properly after uh, that it's been done. Um, continue to use their current medications, including inhaled corticosteroids. Use oral steroids only with a severe flare-up and avoid using nebulizers wherever possible. And use a well-fitted mask and spacer is the preferred option. Uh, advising not to share medications and spacers, well, the reality is we know everyone shares in their family. They share their spacers and they share their puffers. But we really should be advising during COVID not to do that and advise them to make sure that they've got medication on hand. And so that's the list of resources um, there. And really, thank you very much for attending. And here is the QR code that um, Melissa mentioned before, if you have your smartphones ready, that you can scan that QR code now. Um, that will take you through to the evaluation survey. And we would really appreciate if you could do that evaluation um, because we don't know if these things are working if nobody tells us that they're not working. So thank you very much. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks, Suzanne. We did have one question come through. It was just about dosages um, in the questions box. And it says, do we use weight for salbutocol? Oh dosage or less than 20 kilos or greater than 20 kilos or age or can we use either so basically is the dosage based on weight or age yeah okay that may have come through before i uh, clarified that but basically Sorry. under six is um is under six is uh the cutoff and over six so under six is uh six puffs or 2.5 milligram nebule and over six is 12 up to 12 puffs and five milligram nebule so hopefully that um has thank you uh clarified that and thank you so much for presenting tonight. It was really informative and enjoyable presentation. So th thank you so much, Suzanne. Um, and I'll just remind and encourage everyone to complete that survey. Your feedback's really important to us um, and it helps with planning further education events. And we just a reminder, we are being recorded tonight. It will be available on our website in the education library for a limited time um, over the next week or so. And if you haven't already submitted your REC GP number, to me if you could please send it through to myself um, for those points okay and thank you everyone for attending tonight um, enjoy your evening and good night thanks melissa thanks suzanne